Have you ever wondered why is it that so many businesses fail at participating in what's called high yield investment programs, whereas private placement programs managed by sub programs, or even acquiring things like stand matters or credit, SBLCs, and buying it at a low cost, trying to monetize it and sell it at a higher cost? Why is that so many people are failing every day doing this? In this video, I'm going to give you four secrets you've got to use if you're interested in participating in this industry successfully. You've got to watch this video. Hi, I'm Tamar Zaman from Alphos Global, previously known as LanaCredit.ai. My organization helps successful businesses leverage their assets, their cash, their stamps, or credit like that to access capital that the banks are primarily offering to their VIP customers. We were able to do this because of our relationships, our volumes, our experience, and, uh, and our expertise. The capital that our clients are getting today allows them to fund their business, to grow their business, to buy auxiliary businesses. Well, a common question I get all the time is, Tamor, we want to participate in a high yield investment program that we heard through a flyer, through a joker broker, through a group of joker brokers, through an accountant we trust, and boy, there's a lot of fraud in it. How can you help us out? The source of this particular video started for me about two weeks ago when an investment group contacted me. And they said that they heard about high yield investment programs, they, heard, they thought the returns are way too good to be true. They started to read uh, white papers, PDFs. I don't even know where you get PDFs about these things. <laughs> uh, they talked to a bunch of what I refer to as joker brokers. They got convinced that these programs exist. Thank God that, that they got convinced these programs exist. And uh, what they did was this investment group, they raised some money and they said, okay, we understand that these are high programs, high failure rate. So we're going to raise money and put money into a whole bunch of different programs. Unfortunately for this particular group, unfortunately a lot of their programs, uh, the, the programs that they want to participate in fail. So uh, we got a call after they went on YouTube and found me. <laughs> and so I thought I'd put a video together about four big mistakes that our clients do, what you can do to what if you want to participate in this. First rule I want to tell you as the purpose of this video is not for solicitation purposes at all. Uh, the purpose of this video is strictly for entertainment and education purposes only. My name is Tamer Zaman. You can look me up on Amazon. I'm the author of multiple books. My recent book is Structured Finance Demystified. I have a number of other books coming up on cryptocurrencies, uh, credit markets, uh, just a whack of different books, primarily around banking and how to leverage banks, uh, bank licenses to access lines of credit and loans uh, from a securities perspective. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what these high yield programs are about and why they're so attractive. High yield investment programs, as far as I can tell, have been in existence since the second king of England. Uh, that defaulted on the first uh, was called what today would be called a stand matter of credit. Uh, but primarily they took off in the end of year, end of World War II, when something called private placement programs were designed. And really the intention of these high yield programs at the core of it, and I'm giving you the 50,000 feet level of it, is you're buying a product or you're taking a product from one market and you're taking it to another market, selling it to another market, IA and getting a really high yield, a high amount of profit from it. Primarily the source of high yield investment programs, there's a private person program, matched by a sub program, buying SBLC, leasing SBLC, monetizing SBLC, primarily at the source of it, you're taking a product from one market, you're selling it in another market. And that's the simplest way of saying it. Just so the common person can understand what I mean, imagine, imagine you and me go to Japan, we buy Toyota, we go and see Toyota, uh, we buy Toyota cars and we bring the Toyota cars from the Japan market to the United States where America doesn't manufacture Toyotas uh, per se and then you uh, sell the Toyotas into the U.S. market and make a margin off it. A different way to think about it is imagine you and me go to Saudi Arabia where they produce oil. We take oil, we take it to a country that doesn't produce oil like um, United States <laughs> and we sell oil to the U.S. market. So the buying of a, of a product from one market and selling it to another market. 
high yield investment programs, whether it's a match buy sell program, private placement programs, which whatever version you want, think about it. At the source of it, that's what you're doing. You're taking a banking instrument from one of the top 20 banks, you're selling it to one of the top, one of the lowest 20 banks. Also, an example of it would be you're getting a standard of credit from HSBC. Uh, and you're selling it to the No Name Bank of Africa because the No Name Bank of Africa, their credit facility or their credit rating is zero. So when you give them a hundred million dollars amount of credit, it's worth a lot of money to them. As an example only. Or you take a medium term note from one of the top 20 banks, you're selling it to a tier two market, which would be a pension fund, hedge fund, people that don't have the AAA credit rating. At the source of it, all you're doing is you're taking a product from one market selling it, monetizing it into a different market, and that's what high yield investment programs, whichever version of it you want to label, think about is as that. These programs are really attractive, primarily to entrepreneurs and the different types of entrepreneurs. There are entrepreneurs that love fairy tales. They just love fairy tales. Anything that's a high yield investment program where you put two dollars and all of a sudden become trillions of dollars, unfortunately there are some entrepreneurs who love fairy tales. And the minute they hear about these things, they just gravitate to it. Doesn't matter what FBI tells them, doesn't matter what their mother, father, banks, doesn't matter what they say, they just like gravitate to these things. There's a lot of other entrepreneurs who need project financing in different jurisdictions. So imagine you run an entrepreneur runs an oil and gas company in Tanzania. And that's just you know, it's a true story. My first client, first time I was a credit was seven years ago, and I was an oil and gas, it was an oil CEO in Tanzania, and he wanted to expand his oil business, he needed capital, but the local bank in Tanzania doesn't have $50 million to give an oil guy. It's, like, it's a legitimate business, it's an oil business. These industries need 50 million, 100 million, 120 million, and a local small bank doesn't can give them that amount of capital. These entrepreneurs need something called alternative financing industry. In the United States, in the Netherlands, in a lot of countries where I have clients in, uh, price of real estate goes up, interest rates goes up, uh, the investors, the numbers just don't make sense, and so clients don't qualify for what's called traditional banking. They just don't qualify it, or they can't get as much capital as they need for traditional banking. So that's when alternative funding becomes, or alternative funding industry becomes a viable option, and unfortunately, a lot of people get into these what's called high yield programs. They hear about them, they want to get into them. Uh, they understand that there's, sometimes they know that there's a lot of fraud in it, and they get caught in it sometimes if you don't do things correctly. So this investment group that contacted me uh, raised money. They went into a whole bunch of different uh, versions of high yield investment programs with small amounts of capital, like 50,000 here, 75,000 there. And they taught that by diversifying this in small amounts of high yield investment programs that are going to get these massive returns. They actually calculated that a good chunk of their programs will fail, but the ones that will pay off will pay off multiples and therefore they can pay their investors groups out. And long story short, they fail at all of them. So I want to give you the four steps that we do at All Funds Global. Uh, because A, I'm, I'm interested in participating in these programs myself. I've been doing it for some time. I don't solicit this to the public. I'm not looking for the average person to come and invest with me or something. But this is the area that I feel I have some expertise. I wouldn't say I'm an industry leader in it, but I have some domain expertise compared to a lot of people that I see out there. So I'm going to give you the four big things that we do uh, that others fail at doing. So the first mistake a lot of my customers do is they deposit a small amount of program in what's called a high yield program. They'll put 250 bucks in an internet scam. They'll put 5,000 bucks in what they think is something else. They'll put $20,000 in what they think is they're going to get a stamp out of credit. They'll put, I don't know, $100,000 in what they think is a private prison program. Like they put a small amount of money into what's called a high yield investment program. These things just by default, but in step one, it doesn't work. Any banker, any investment trader that works for a bank, bank or legitimate bank, needs a minimum of $100 million. That's what a legitimate investment banker needs who works at a real bank. Why? Please fact check everything I'm about to tell you. Please fact check everything I'm about to tell you. When you deposit $100 million with a central bank, the central bank gives the banker, the trader, a line of credit 10 times multiples. 
So $100 million becomes a billion dollars. A trader that's trading with a billion dollars can do a lot of things that compared to somebody who's running a fraudulent website or fraudulent program or, or some kind of a hokey pokey program, they're asking clients to put small amounts of money, 250 bucks, 5,000 bucks, uh, 50,000 bucks. $50,000 times 10 becomes $500,000. If I was a trader, I honest to God, I don't know what I can do with $500,000. There's not much I can do with $500,000 when it comes to buying a banking instrument or leasing a banking instrument. It's just not much I can do with $500,000. And then oftentimes the people that are putting 250 bucks, 5,000 bucks, 50,000 bucks are everyday common average people. The average household, when they put 250 bucks or 5,000 bucks or 50,000 bucks, the guy needs the money to pay his rent the following month, the following quarter, the following year, he needs that money. So these people, you're, you're taking money that's not sticky. You're taking money that's not sticky. You're taking money from a population that needs money all the time. When you're working with a real trader, the real trader only and only and only works with ultra high net worth individuals. Let me say this again. A real trader will work with an ultra high net worth individual, not even high net worth individuals. Because the ultra high net worth individual is not going to deposit 50 grand, he's going to deposit $50 million and he doesn't even need it for a year or two years. So if you give a trader $50 million and you say you can multiply this money as much as you want and I don't need it for a year, that $50 million turns into $5 billion on a credit and the amount of transactions you can do with $5 billion credit, especially with a client that doesn't need their deposit back, is massively different to compared to a guy who's paying 50 bucks. So step one of why a lot of our clients fail into going into high yield investment programs is because they're putting small amounts of money into some fraudulent program that's asking for small amounts of money. And that formula, that just, just on step one on one, it doesn't work. It does a failure right there. Step two, why our clients fail is oftentimes they don't have a due diligence process. I wanna say this again, oftentimes my clients don't have a due diligence process. I have brokers, I call them joker brokers, who have zero banking experience, and they're in some kind of, uh, I don't know what trade, business, whatever they're in, and they spend a year, a year uh, talking to people that sell instruments, lease instruments, monetize instruments, people who claim to be in private placement programs, so that they spend a year, they'll talk to a hundred of them, hundred of them. I mean, you go to, a, imagine you go to a party and you meet a hundred people, at the end of the party of meeting 100 people, there's gotta be one or two people that you like. If you go to a party that has 100 people, generally speaking, by the end of the party, there's one or two people you're gonna like. So I have joker brokers or clients who will spend a year talking to a whole bunch of fraudulent people and, they, they'll, and they, they use their human intuition. They'll use their human intuition to say this person is legit. They don't have a, a process they don't have a, a process to filter through uh, transactions. In North America, I, our divorce rate in North America is over 55%. Our divorce rate in North America is over 55%. That's people who are using their human intuition to say this spouse is somebody I trust, I love, I'm, you know, like I'm gonna spend the rest of my life with. So just trust me, I've been in my business. I wasn't born yesterday in my business. I've been at it for many years. Human intuition is not good enough when you come in front of my face to say, hey, we have a private placement program, or we found this guy, we trust him, he's gonna issue Sam Harris credit. Like this is just, human intuition just doesn't cut it. So I'll tell you about Alphonse Global because I have one of the most robust systems and processes that I know of in the freaking industry. Step one, when we wanna do business with what's called private person program, a banker, a trader, somebody who issues SBSC, somebody who monitors SBSCs, they have to, have to, have to go through a former FBI, former CIA background check. And our people who do background checks, they're not doing um, you know, jokey, joker broker background checks. They're doing massive deep background checks in a, in a spe specific domain called white collar crime. So my background check people are awesome. They're deep experts at it. They'll find things that lawyers cannot find. So that's step 101. Step 102 in our filter process, in our due diligence process, there's no human intuition here. So due diligence process. Step two, 
that the person who, who gets vetted out has to go and uh, they get the, the contract goes to what's called securities lawyer. I'm gonna give you one example of 10,000 cases I can give you. We had last year a company, I won't mention the company, uh, they are in the financial services industry, they've been there for 20 years, very, very, very reputable firm that wanted to go into a private placement program. They called us and they wanted us to put our money with them to go into this private placement program. That was their intention, let's, let's go and do this together. And they had done their so-called due diligence on the platform. Our security lawyer sent a note to the bank, not to the platform, to the bank, saying we, are, we want, we're interested in pursuing, can you send us a note saying that the money that we're depositing is, is acknowledged to be our money and not somebody else's money. The compliance manager of the bank never responded to that email. The compliance officer of the bank never responded to that email. And this is a quote-unquote trade platform that was registered with SEC, and, and I don't know whatever else due diligence that was done on them, and so we never pursued it. We never went forward with that platform. The financial services con a company today has a litigation lawsuit against that platform. So step two in our process is once they pass through FBI, CIA background checking, they go into a securities office, securities lawyer to check out the paperwork, and we're looking for making sure the capital we're putting in is not collateralized, is not held as collateral, acknowledge that the capital belongs to us. Now comes step three, step three. We fly, we get on this thing called the aeroplane, we fly around the world to meet face to face, eye to eye, people that claim to be the trader. Whether they're selling the same amount of credit, monetizing same amount of credit, doing a match buy sell, private placement program, I don't care what the high yield investment program of the day is, we fly to meet them face to face. This is called a due diligence process. It's expensive like hell. But if you're putting $100 million of your money, if you're putting $10 million of your money, I promise you it's worth every single step. A lot of my clients, A, they don't have the thinking mentality. They go this thing called, you know, feeling, our feeling, uh, intuition. I've talked to 100 people, uh, look at the documents I've got. I trust these two people. Out of the year that I've spoken to 100 joker brokers, I trust these two people. And I promise you, I've been in my business a lot of time, people that use human intuition and of the day don't, can perform, don't perform, very, very unlikely for them to get the financial result that they're looking for. And I've been in my business long enough to know that you need to have a filter process to go through a rerun a process. Now, if you can't afford, you know, these things are expensive to do. If you can't afford a CIA guy, FBI guy, uh, you can't afford to fly. I highly recommend my first book, I don't mean to solicit, but my first book, Hyper Growth Chapter 8, I talk about uh, investment policy and how you choose your investment policy of secure capital, secure for rate of return, secure for exit plan as a human check. At least, at least you still have a filter process to find, to get rid of the fraudulent transactions in high investment programs so that you can be successful. The third thing, the third biggest mistake my customers do is they do process shopping and price shopping. I don't know why they do that. Oftentimes the client is naive. They hire a joker broker, really a joker broker, who I have no idea which college even graduated that joker broker from. And the joker broker starts to do this thing called process shopping, calls around 50 providers to say, I have a high net worth client by the way, the client has only five bucks in the bank account. The joker broker doesn't even know the client has five bucks in the bank account. Trust me, I've been in business for a long time. And we want this block funds program. We want this, we want that. You might be demand that you, you adhere to our process or, you be, or we're looking for the cheapest monetization or cheapest price for the instrument or we're looking for the highest person that's going to spend. Like some nonsense, they're shopping around. I'm telling you, private banking is not an industry that you do shopping around. It's not a shopping around kind of industry. I've been in it for a long time. It's relationship-based, it's expertise-based, experience-based. It's not a shopping for process-based uh, industry, unfortunately. So that's the, one of the biggest mistakes I see a lot of my customers do all along. Now comes the fourth biggest mistake that a lot of my customers do, and these are things that you can avoid. The fourth biggest mistake in a nutshell is that my customers don't have any real banking experience. 
Private banking and retail banking are two different religions altogether. The only thing they have common is the word banking. It's the word, it's like Christianity. I'm, I apologize, I'm not familiar with all the religions in the world, but I'll tell you about Christianity. If you go to a Catholic church on a Sunday, whatever you experience, it's going to be different to when you go to a Protestant church in the afternoon. And if you think about Scientology, if you even consider that as a Christian religion of any kind, it's like there's just so different, so different that you could say that has nothing in common. And that's the analogy I'll tell you about retail banking versus private banking. When you're working with a real banker, like a real trader from our, from our side, when a client is working with a real, real banker, a real banker will never ask the client, show me proof of funds. They need to see some kind of proof of funds. If you're a high net worth individual and you claim you have $10 million, obviously we need to provide the banker with a proof of funds of $10 million. Where you know you're working with a real banker, is a real banker will say, I want permission to verify the proof of funds. I want permission to contact your bank and I want permission to verify the source of funds. If you're working with a joker broker, you will never get a real banker on the other side that will ask you those things. Every legitimate banker will need to know what's the, not your proof of funds, but what's the source of those funds. And they want permission to verify that from your bank. That's what a real banker would do. Another challenge that a lot of our customers have because they don't have these banking experiences that they want to get into a private placement program and they want to get into a trade, they want to go get a stamp out of credit from one market, Mont has a different market, they don't know the correct way of doing these things. So when it comes to getting a stamp out of credit, oftentimes there's a bit, lot of money to be made when you can or if you are able to get a stamp out of credit from one of the top 20 banks in the world and monetize it, sell it, lend it to, to one of the to bottom 20 banks in the world, there's a lot of margin to be made in there. Oftentimes, the monetize, the person who's paying you the money, will say, I want an RWA. I want an email from the issuing bank, the bank that's issuing the same amount of credit, uh, to say, I'm RWA, I'm ready, willing, able to do the transaction. When that RWA email comes from all of the top 20 banks, the correct procedure is Here's the email, ready, willing, able to send you $100 million stamp of credit, $5 million stamp of credit, whatever the domain, the amount is, doesn't matter. Here's our, with that, they should, they should send, by the way, here's the languaging of the instrument. Here's the languaging of the instrument. So I'm going to give you a stamp of credit, it's going to be a purchase, it's going to be cash back, divisible, uh, like, like it's going to give you the languaging of it. So the RWA must accompany uh, the languaging of the instrument. See, a lot of our clients are not that sophisticated. They don't know that this is what it should look like. All they go is, oh, the joker broker that I trust said so I just need to put up $5 million and some ma magically I'm going to get $5 trillion. Another thing that I'll tell you what we do within Alphonse Global, what we attempt to do every single time, every single time, who is the issue bank, who is the monetizing bank, how can we help our clients get an account with the issuing bank, get an account with the monetizing bank, then once you have the account with those banks, then you go to your banker with your contract with the issuer or uh, Hey, Mr. Banker, I'm a client of the firm. Here's my bank ID, whatever it is. Here's my joint venture agreement with this match by sell. Can you, since I'm a client, verify the instrument has been sent or can you verify the instrument has been received? You can do that only if you're a client of the bank and then you have the JV agreement. That's how you can now control have control on the issuing and the monetizing side. A lot of joker brokers who've been in my industry for 20 years, they still don't know that they can do that or that's what they should do. Why? The guy never worked a day of his life in banking. He never did. He's, I don't know what he's doing during the day. He's maybe Uber driving or something. I don't know. Like the guy doesn't come from private banking. Next one, when you want to do these trades, private placement programs, match by sell programs, consider some banking instruments going from some location, location A, to location B. You're selling this in location B. Fine. In that process, one bank is taking the instrument. Like, I'll give you just a simple analogy. If you want to send a stamp out of credit from a European bank to an African bank, it's very, very, very unlikely that these two banks have a direct relationship. 99.999% of the time, there's corresponding banks. It's like when you want to take a flight from Toronto to Kabul, Afghanistan. I don't know one flight that goes from Toronto to Kabul, Afghanistan. You have to take a whole bunch of connecting flights. Well, the same thing happens with sending an instrument from an issuer to a monetizer. There's a whole bunch of corresponding banks. 
And in that, there's something called an RMA. The most simplest way I can describe an RMA, the simplest way, but it's something you can Google, is um, it's a tunnel that the banking instrument goes through. If, if you don't know that that's the process, who are all the corresponding banks, what's the tunnel, there's a high failure rate. Once you know the corresponding banks, you have accounts on both ends, you can control the transaction, you can exponentially increase the outcome of you getting the financial result you're looking for. I'll tell you the last one. This is a very popular one. A lot of my clients go to these joker brokers, these issuers and monetizers, and they get these contracts. And the contracts will have terms. Uh, we're gonna do something called MT799. Well, what the hell is an MT799? Who how come this is not a common word? Uh, MT79, and the most common about me saying it, is an issue of a stamp out of credit before they send an instrument to the monetizing bank, to a receiving bank in the secondary market. They want to make sure the bank on the receiving side has the money to give to them. It's kind of like not blocking your money, but it's kind of in a way blocking the money, proof of funds. This document, the word MT79, is on 9,999 documents out there on buying, selling, monetizing banking instruments. There's only one place on the planet that I know the truth is written on that document, and that's my freaking company, Alphonse Global. In Alphonse Global, we know MT79 got discontinued a long time ago, and the actual phrase is MT759. MT759. You can look this up for yourself. So when a client doesn't have banking experiences, they go and they Google things like, okay, what's the MT799? Oh, this makes sense. Oh, I have a contract that says MT799. I, I can Google this, so that makes sense. Because the bank, the client doesn't come from a private banking experience and doesn't do 10,000 of these transactions a day, they go, okay, this makes sense. If the client is at least works, talks to a fraud department, a fraud department will tell you, MT799 has got this continued a long time ago. MT759 is what you should go to. Anyway, so those are four biggest mistakes my clients do. They put small amounts of money because they want to test run something in a small cap program that's fraudulent. Let me tell you, if you have five bucks, this is not a program that, these programs, I would never, ever, ever, ever invite you to even think about if you have five bucks or 50,000 bucks. You need to be a high net worth individual to join these programs. Day one, if you don't, shame on you kind of thing, like if I can say that. Part two. The reason that these programs don't work is a lot of our clients don't have a formal or any kind of a real due diligence process. We have a formal due diligence process that we go through every time. It slows us down, but boy, I love the performance when I see the performance. Those are some of the things that perhaps we can help you with if you're interested. My name is Tamer Zam from All Funds Global. Thank you so much for your time. On behalf of my team and I, we look forward to the opportunity of serving. Now I want to take a minute and answer some of your recently frequently asked questions. The first question I guess Timur will be learning a lot from your YouTube channel. We are really grateful. How do we learn more? Is there an opportunity for us to fly down to meet your team, see if you're a real human person like that? And so my answer to that is, uh, first of all, I'm a published author. I've published multiple books on structured financing, hyper growth, uh, making money on currency wars. So I recommend going to, on Amazon, looking at some of the books that I've published and purchasing that, and reading a lot of content that we don't publish on YouTube. The second is to become a member at All Funds Global. Once you're a registered member, you'll get access to exclusive webinars that once again, we don't publish that on YouTube. Uh, we have very specific content on very uh, specific process services and strategies that we offer only on webinars that we don't do on YouTube. Uh, the third one is that once you become a member, you get access to a lot of offshore uh, banking, private banking, VIP events that we run. And it's a great way to meet us physically, us and our team, get a chance to hang out with us for a few days uh, or a month or a week or however long we are at that offshore site. The next question I get a lot is, hey Tamar, um, you know, what's the big deal about big getting a private banking license? Why are you so passionate about this? Imagine, imagine you have a coffee shop and I have a coffee shop and our coffee shops are like, uh, 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 you know, like side by side. And we're buying the coffee from the same brewer. There's no competition between you and me. Imagine you have a banking license and I don't. 
If you have a private bank license, imagine if you made $500,000 and I made $500,000. You would take your $500,000 and you would deposit it a central bank in the jurisdiction that you have a private banking uh, license for. So typically when you deposit this at $500,000, but the central bank, the central bank will give your private bank a line of credit at 10 times multiples. So now that $500,000 becomes a $5 million line of credit that you get. If you take out that $5 million line of credit and go to whichever country you work with, let's say in Europe or somewhere, and you say, hey, I wanna grow my coffee business. I need funding for something called project financing. And you know when you want to buy real estate, you put down 20% and the bank gives you the other 80% for, for, uh, in form of a loan. Same similar kind of deal. I'm putting out $5 million as a down payment. You miss the bank, give me the other uh, amount of money I need. And so you get a $20 million loan. It's a loan, it's not free money, but I want to compare you and me with each other. I only made $500,000, you got a $20 million loan. Can you outperform me in advertising and hiring better people in investing in technology? Plus, when you have a private banking license, you can structure a lot of really cool things like asset-backed securities, mortgage-backed securities, like you can make a lot of money on your assets, just like banks do. Uh, and so it gives you a lot of advantages to build a business that is financially free, that grows at an exponential level, that a business that doesn't have a private bank assets could not do that. Another frequently asked question I get uh, a lot is, Timor, why is your organization charging us a consultation fee if you guys are making money and structuring a transaction, if you're making money upon performance, why do you charge me an upfront consultation fee? I don't get it. So the reason we charge a consultation fee is, first of all, uh, we publish our content completely for free on YouTube. This is our commitment for global transformation to humanity to publish our content completely for free on various platforms, including YouTube. What that does is that it attracts a lot of scammers, it attracts a lot of tire kickers, it, it even attracts people that have some mental health challenges, as well as some of this market, uh, some of the customers that we would want to build a relationship with. And so when we charge a consultation fee upfront, it removes the tire kickers, the people that are scammers, the people that have mental health issues. The second thing is, in many of the countries that consume our YouTube videos, Alphonse Global does not have uh, securities licenses in many of these jurisdictions around the world. So when we charge an upfront consultation fee, it is like you are hiring a lawyer when you have a case that you want to work, you want the lawyer to work on, you're hiring the lawyer upfront, you're, you're paying the lawyer upfront fee. And so that is what we do. When we charge an upfront consultation fee, if the regulator contacts us from that jurisdiction, we can say we were not soliciting because the client approached us and the client hired us for experience and expertise. The big thing you do want to know is that 100% of the consultation fees is completely refunded, completely refunded upon a transaction being completed. This removes anybody who's not serious, doesn't have a solid business plan, doesn't have something, a solid asset, uh, it becomes a limit. So 100% of the consolidation fees refunded on a transaction happening. It eliminates any securities, uh, jurisdictional issues that we may be facing because we are, uh, our content is consumed worldwide. And it also removes a lot of fraudsters and people that are attacking from our ecosystem for sure. Another question I get a lot is Tamar, talk to me about deep fake. Uh, deep fake in the financial services industry is a concern for me. How can you protect us, our customer information, our transaction, as well as yourself? So the truth is, in the world of internet, it's not a financial services problem, it's an internet problem. I myself can tell you if I have 300 followers on YouTube, I may not have an issue. But once I hit 3 million followers or 30 million followers, the internet by itself will attract people that want to pretend to be me. Now this is, uh, you know, if, you, if I want to talk about financial services, when you're Bank of America, PayPal, or any of the large institutions, you will unfortunately have fraudsters who will try to replicate a bank's uh, website, email address, or something like that, just to get customer information so they can fraud customers. I want to tell you for me, in my industry, alternative funding, I have a lot of legitimate competitors. I, 
put in our funds global. We have a lot of legitimate uh, competitors that have been in the business far longer than I have. They produce results, they're hardworking, honest people that I know them, I know them, we know each other. And unfortunately, there's been a lot of fraudsters or people that may have not had good experiences that have gone on some fake website and have made fraudulent claims about our competitors. And in many cases, they even have, unfortunately, have litigations against them. In the United States, please fact check what I'm sharing with you. In the United States, the United States uh, has 3% of the world's population and has 80% of the world's lawyers. The United States has 3% of the world's population as 80% of the world's lawyers. So, if you, so we have a lot of our competitors who are legitimate players, but they have this fruitless lawsuits around them for like really for no reason whatsoever. Now, within Alphonse Global, uh, I've always claimed that the reason we don't, as of the date of this video, the reason we don't have any lawsuits against us or some website claiming we're fraudulent players is simply because it's been a lack of my vision. The PR answer I do need to say or give is that we hire uh, people that have high integrity and we always operate by the book and, and like nonsense like that. And, and that's honestly, God, that's just nonsense. The reason that we don't have any lawsuits as of the date of shooting this video or, or people claiming we're fraudsters is simply because I, Tamar, my vision as a founder of a company has been very limited. You know, I wasn't trying to uh, shake, shake the tree. Uh, if you look at all the companies you work with, if you use consume Tylenol, if whatever car you drive, Ford, Mercedes Benz, if you use Google, look at all the companies you work with every single day. All of them have litigations against them as part of, uh, it's called part of growing a business. And so as I develop leaders within our organization, my leaders will do whatever my leaders do. We have over 800 brokers that the 800 brokers will do and say whatever they do and say. And it's bound to happen at some point in the future, unfortunately, that some customer will misunderstand something, not understand private banking, not understand something, or, or, or a competitor that will say, hey, Alphonse Global is growing really fast. Let me go on some websites and claim that these people are fraudsters or some, some nonsense like that. And so my invitation around deep fake for you is a bad concern. Always, always do your own due diligence on people you want to work with, including our competitors. Uh, let that listen to your intuition, ask the what, why, who, where, when, let that. And if you can afford to, if you can afford to hire private investigators to even work with or investigate the people you want to work, um, uh, work with, I highly recommend. Uh, next question I get Tim, uh, is Timor, uh, you know, if we want to work with Alphonse Global, what are all the services you can offer us from integration wealth and global banking services to, you know, stand out or subscribe? Like, what are all the services you can offer us? The truth is, I don't know about you. I don't know who you are. I don't know what is it you're up to. I don't know what your core values are. So I can offer a frequently asked question, not knowing what every case is about. Uh, what I can tell you within Alphonse Global, our mission, our vision in life, the purpose of our business is how do we help businesses become self-funded for life? How do we help businesses become self-funded for life? Now, this is not a new concept. There's hundreds and thousands, if not millions of companies out there that are self-funded for life. So if I had, uh, you know, $50,000 to $500,000, I would probably look at an income accelerator program where I can work with a Forex trader, somebody I can make an investment with a Forex trader and not with Alphonse Global, you're not making an investment with Alphonse Global, please, please do not hear this association, I'm not soliciting. If I had 50 to $500,000, I would look for an income accelerator program, a Forex program like that, that I can put money with, and it would, the intention is not an investment thing per se, but the vision is how do I become a self-funded business by having multiple revenue streams. And so income accelerator program does that. If I had five hundred thousand dollars or more, like five hundred thousand dollars to maybe ten million dollars, I would certainly look at match by sell programs of buying instruments, leasing instruments, monetizing them and keeping them spread for myself. I would for sure, for sure do that. If I had more than ten million dollars, again, please don't hear that the decision is not. I'm just telling you the things that I would do. I would definitely look at a private business program where the money is bought in my account. Once you're into one of these programs, the second thing I think it would be appropriate for you to do is to really look for a consulting firm like Alphonse Global and say, how can you help structure something for intergenerational wealth, 
our global banking services. This is probably a service that you can't ask your chief financial officer to do or your lawyer to do. You need somebody like us that has a global reach, that has banking experiences, that has asset protection experiences to structure something that is useful for you. Uh, some other things that I would do is I would definitely reach out to Alphonse Global, that would be our firm, and say, do you have a mastermind group or do you have a advisory services for some of the things that you guys do and how you could uh, be helpful to us? Those will be some of the frequently when, when people ask me, well, what are some things you could do for a company? <laughs> that's my general answer that's not solicited. My name is Tamer Zaman from Alphonse Global. On behalf of my team, my staff, our stakeholders, I want to say thank you for trusting us. I want to say thank you for checking us out. And hopefully we look forward to the opportunity of being of service.